Well, my name is Jerry Clark, and I am here to uh, start the next few lessons on Romans. I am a part of the teaching team with Kelly, and you, we usually do these on Sunday morning in the adult Bible study. And we're trying something a little bit different today. We're trying to do this through the video to give you an opportunity not just to see me, but uh, to see something and to be able to uh, use your Bible and uh, go through the passages right along with us. And uh, hopefully this will be a little bit more uh, normal than uh, we have been in the past with our Bible study. Uh, it's a unique time in our society today. Uh, unique might be a uh, one word that you could describe it, but uh, for me, I'm ready for this to be over, primarily because I'm gaining weight. We have used more sugar, more flour, more butter in the last month than we have used in the last two years. I think the president should have banned Pinterest at least the food section on Pinterest, because we've been looking at that. And, you know, when you're sort of in your home and you don't have the freedom to go out different places or whatever else, you start looking for those comfort foods or those items that uh, you, you like. And then you find new things that you would like to try because you've got time to bake. And uh, so, I've, you know, I've been eating a lot. And Pinterest is terrible because it gives you pictures and recipes of all these desserts that people try to put everything into uh, because I guess they have a lot of time. And you see something that attracts your attention or makes your mouth water. Uh, something like snickerdoodle cream cheese apple pie or maple bacon cupcakes. And here's two of my favorites, brownie pecan pie, ooey gooey butter cake. And then chocolate chip cookie dough brownie bomb. You know, just looking at that makes my cholesterol go way up. I figure that if I survive this virus, that they'll find me in my recliner, passed away with a half a cupcake in my hand from a maple bacon snickerdoodle brown sugar chocolate chip cookie dough muffin of some sort. So each of us have, are doing different things or learning new things. And this is a new thing for me. I've never done a video lesson. I'm used to having people in front of me. And uh, it's sort of different of being able to look out at nothing and uh, or looking at a camera and gauging what you're saying as being appropriate or uh, being relevant or teachable. Okay, so where are we? We're in Romans. Kelly did a great job with the introduction and the first four lessons. And just a little bit about Romans to refresh your memory. Uh, again, Paul wrote the letter from the city of Corinth, the Greek city of Corinth, in A.D. 57. Now this was three years after a 16-year-old emperor named Nero came to power as the emperor of Rome. Now, Paul, when he wrote this letter, had never been to Rome. He had wanted to go a number of times, but was always prevented by one thing or another. Although he obviously had talked to a number of people who went on to Rome and probably relayed some of his thoughts and, and sermons or other things to the churches there in Rome. Um, it's interesting that the persecution did not come to Rome until uh, several years later. So the letter that uh, Paul wrote was to a church that was really uh, having or experiencing a time of relative peace. But a church 
that needed a strong dose of the basic gospel doctrine, uh, which would help strengthen them for the persecution that was to come in a few years. Uh, one theologian said that the, the book of Romans uh, stands as the clearest and most systematic uh, presentation of Christian doctrine in all of scripture. Wow, <laughs> that's quite a lot. Uh, and the way that I look at it is that we could take the letter to Romans and say it's a letter to Montgomery or it's a letter to Houston or uh, any number of communities because as Paul put it in uh, Timothy, is that all scripture is God breathed, which means that this Bible is alive. It's a living word of God. It's not just tales that were told or old stories uh, from the past, but it is irrelevant today as it was 2000 years ago. You know, when it says it was God breathed, God breathed into Adam and he became alive. God breathed into these people and these scriptures who wrote the scriptures and it became alive. And so as we look at these scriptures today, we need to look at them in uh, relationship to where we are as a church, where we are as Christians, and even where we are as a city or a county or a state. So we're gonna be looking at, letter, at the letter of Romans, and we're gonna be looking at a number of verses here. And just as a quick review, the letter in chapter one begins with the sinfulness of all humanity. Uh, we are all accountable to God. Uh, even if you did, do, did not know the scriptures, you were accountable. Even if you did know the scriptures and the law, as the Jews did, you were accountable. So all people were accountable. And uh, so it carries on to there that uh, about judging others, which were the Jews were, uh, 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 the Jews were having problems with that and judging uh, others in, in their society because they were the ones who said that they were the keepers of the law. And then in lesson four, uh, Paul says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's how he begins lesson four. And he says that both Jews and Gentiles fall under this. But then at the end, he gives the example of Abraham's faith, putting in, in his faithfulness to God and his promises of justifying his uh, behavior or justifying him before God as righteous. So that's sort of where we're right going to begin. And we're going to start with verse four, uh, I mean, chapter four, verse 25, which says, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So what he, Paul is saying here is that the result of our justification, or you might want to use the word acquittal because justification means acquittal for our sins, or you could say we were made righteous, right, in the, the uh, view of God, uh, that however you want to say it is that we are in a different relationship with God as a result of Jesus' sacrifice for us. And in verse five, one and two, he said, therefore, carrying on from this thought in verse 25, 425, he said, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now, sta <clears throat> which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope 
of the glory of God. So what's he saying here? He is saying that uh, we have peace with God because of this acquittal, this justification in our relationship with God. We have peace. Now, usually when we think of peace, the general definition that you see is uh, peace is usually defined as absence of conflict. Now this might be war, absence of war, but you know, it could be conflict with our neighbors, uh, it could be conflict with uh, our bosses, or our co-workers, or even within our family. Uh, so uh, this is not the peace that Paul is talking about. P, Paul was referring uh, to our relationship with God as a, re, a result of our faith in the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you look in John 14, 27, and I'm reading from the NIV, I forgot to mention that earlier, but 14, 27, here is Jesus's words. He says, peace I live with you, leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give it to you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now he was telling this to the disciples, not too, uh, knowing that not too long he was going to go to the cross. And he knew that their lives were all of a sudden going to be in crises. That there were going to be all sorts of rumors, all sorts of uh, persecution that would come through. They would be hunted. You know, lots of things were going to happen. So he says, you know, I'm going to give you peace. And then the peace I give you is not as the world gives. Because the world only gives a, a peace in that original definition. A peace where there is no war. Or um, maybe a peace where uh, you have some type of don uh, detente with your neighbors or your friends or something like that, or you've come to an agreement or something like this. The peace that he is saying is not just the absence of conflict, it is an inner spiritual peace that Jesus has already won. His work is concluded in that he has won. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So he is saying that no matter what the circumstances is, you can have peace. I mean, Jesus, you know, we call Jesus, one of the characteristics of Jesus, we call him the Prince of Peace. And he mentions peace a lot. And so he is saying that I can, through your faith, through your justification, through your right relationship with God, you are going to have peace, peace with God. You know, inside the US today, we're dealing with a conflict. In fact, the president at one, point said, we are at war. Uh, you can't see the enemy. Uh, you can't touch it. It can strike anywhere, anytime, any age. It's a tiny virus that has turned this country upside down and destroyed a lot of peace for a lot of people. We fight it with mask, disinfectant, washing our hands, not touching our face, and a new term called social distancing. We're shutting down businesses, schools, parks, and for some inexplicable reason, we're hoarding toilet paper. 
Did you know that from the middle of January to the middle of March, medications for anxiety, prescriptions for these, rose 34%. So peace has been disturbed in this country. I mean, let's look at it. Everything was going great. Uh, the job market was doing well. Uh, unemployment was at 50 year low. The stock market was gaining every day. Uh, 401ks, uh, you know, everybody was out buying and planning for the future. And then within a matter of a month, it all went upside down. And now no one's really sure. Uh, before I came here, I think I was watching the news and you know, there were 26 million people filing for unemployment benefits. These were people who a month, two months ago, had no worries. And now they're in a conflict. Yet even in this conflict, the peace is a, it, that is beyond our understanding, that spiritual peace that God is in control that whatever comes, he is here to comfort, he is here to support, to listen, to act. We have access to the creator of the universe. And Paul says, instead of complaining, he said, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Instead of complaining, we rejoice. That same word comes from the Greek word that means to boast. We can boast in our hope of the glory of God. Now, what is the glory of God? Well, I think it is knowing that the hope and the glory of God is that one day God is going to walk on this earth again. What he started and what sin interrupted is going to be finished or done one day and everything will be restored. Just as God walked, into, walked in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, he will again walk on this earth one day. We have that hope in the future. We have that knowledge and that relationship that when the glory of God comes, we're going to be there with him. Paul continues in verses three and four. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character and character, hope. Wow. <laughs> um, we can brag because he says rejoice we can brag in our afflictions and the Greek word here for afflictions describes that which produces pressure on the individual either physical or emotional so we can rejoice even though we feel like we're being pressured uh, from all sides. Um, sometimes we don't look at it that way because we usually view suffering or trials or pressure as the opposite of hope and peace. Uh, we want them to go away. Um, just like I said before, uh, there's a pill for that. And a lot of people are taking those pills. But pills wear off. But the peace of God does not. And he says, afflictions produce endurance. Endurance builds and produces character. It's sort of like flowing right down. In fact, I remember when I read these, I remembered as a parent, you know, when your kids come to you and start griping about 
chores that they have to do, or why do they have to do this, or even why they don't want to do their homework and they'd rather go out and do something else. You know, I used to look at them and my favorite phrase, and one they still remember today because they use it on their own children, is that uh, this builds character. They hated that phrase because they knew that hey, they were going to have to do whatever they had to do. And so the coronavirus is an affliction on all of us. Are we using this time to build character or just complaining? You know, these last few weeks, we have had the opportunity to not to be busy. Busy is a byword of our culture. Oh, I'm so busy. I got so many things I've got to do. I got places to go, meetings, whatever else. I'm just so busy. And we all think and say in our minds, oh, there are certain things that I've been wanting to do, but I'm just so busy I can't do them. Well, guess what? <laughs> now you're not busy. You can do them. Some of you probably have. We have an opportunity to take this time and endure. And this endurance will help build our characters. Psalm 46 is a great psalm for uh, these times. In verse 10, the first part of it says, be still and know that I am God. Well, we have time to be still. We have social distancing. <laughs> you can even get away from people and it's okay. You can sit on your porch or uh, out in your yard or in your office or wherever else and you can do some things like reading scripture, praying, or whatever else, or just thinking about you and your relationship with God. The last part of this verse says, as we produce perseverance, perseverance produces character and character hope. Wow. Hope. And during the suffering, the hardship produces Christians with a different expectation, a different outlook, a different confidence. Now, that's rather hard to explain how affliction, persecution, builds character, and then that character leads to hope. But let me give you an example, if I can. A number of years ago, my wife and I, Barbara, had an opportunity to go to Romania. And this was right after uh, the communist wall fell. And not too long after the communist dictator, Ceausescu, uh, was overthrown and uh, freedom came to Romania. In fact, when we landed at the airport in the capital city, uh, as we were taxiing up to the terminal, we looked out the windows and there were army soldiers with machine guns <laughs> spaced evenly. I don't know what they thought we were going to do, but they were guarding the airport. In fact, when we got into the airport, it was a rather rough place because that's where the final battle went on. Uh, where they captured Ceausescu because he was trying to flee the country with his wife and they had a big battle at the airport to prevent him from doing this. And the place was still shot up. There were uh, plywood over the windows and uh, it was rather a dark and gloomy place and we weren't sure what we were getting into. But we got through everything and, and we went up north to a city called cluj Napoca uh, to visit with some Romanian Christians because we were looking to see what their needs were and maybe establish a relationship with them. And we got to meet a lot of great 
Christians. Remember, they had been under a communist dictator for four years, and this communist dictator, uh, his, one of his primary goals was to wipe out Christianity from Romania. He destroyed churches so that he could build administrative buildings. He uh, took their Bibles, destroyed their Bibles. If you were a Romanian Christian, you had a little mark by your name, which said, you cannot go to the university. You cannot have higher education. You cannot take supervisory jobs. Uh, you could not travel outside the country. They put spies in the churches uh, to make sure that they didn't say anything against the dictator or against communism. It, it was against the law that if you were out and about and some, you were talking to someone about Jesus or Christ, you could be arrested and thrown into prison. He did everything to put pressure on these Romanians. Yet, they survived. And, and the remarkable uh, thing that happened was after the wall fell, people, the Romanian people, throng to the churches. The churches were filled overflowing every Sunday. And that sort of perplexed the Romanian Christians because their churches had never been full for 40 years. And now all of a sudden, there were people everywhere. And when you ask these people why were they coming to the churches, they said one thing, I want what you have. Well, the Romanian Christians sort of looked at them and said, we don't have anything. You know, the government took it all. But they said, you have something I don't have. I watched you. I saw your character. I saw in this persecution you never wavered. You never gave up your faith. You helped others. Even though we weren't Christian, you shared the little that you had with us and a whole host of other things. It's interesting that during this time, the Romanian Christians, when they saw another Christian that they recognized from their church or, you know, a friend or whatever else, their greeting was pace. Pace is the Romanian word for peace. So even though they had 40 years of persecution, this persecution developed their character, and their character produced a hope, a countenance, uh, an attitude, or whatever else that people saw. And when they had the opportunity, because these non-Christians were afraid during that time, because they didn't want a mark by their name, uh, after they had the opportunity, they wanted that. So we have peace, we have hope, and now we have chapter 5, verse 5, which says, And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom He has given us. We have a hope that does not disappoint, is confident, it's an expectation that God will bring to completion what He began in Christ. And in fact, you can look back into Romans 1, verse 16, 
because Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. God's love has been poured out in our heart through the Holy Spirit. God's peace, God's hope, and now God's love. I mean, what more could we need? This is a difficult time for people in our community. Uh, everything is being turned upside down. Things we trusted in, our jobs, uh, our economy, our government, all seem to be failing. But we have an opportunity. There's a lot of people out there seeking something because the things that they had put their hope in or their trust in aren't doing it. It's an opportunity for us showing our character, how we're, uh, how we're enduring or how we're handling this situation so that people can come up to us and say, how are you so calm? How do you cope with what's happening? I want what you have. Now verse six through eight, oh man, I'm running out of time because you know, I know you don't wanna watch me for an extended period of time. Uh, what's that old joke? I, I feel like an Egyptian mummy pressed for time. So let me go through verses six through eight just sort of combine all of those real quickly. Uh, as Paul says, you see, just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Paul uses in these verses three words to define uh, humanity's position relative to God. We were helpless, we were ungodly, and we were sinners. Helpless means powerless. You know, we can't do anything on our own. Ungodly sinners means we've rebelled against God. But at the right time, which means there's nothing arbitrary about God's timing. He came and saved us. Christ died for us, even though we were helpless, even though we were ungodly and sinners, Christ died for us. The death of Jesus as it's summarized in, in verse seven. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. In other words, what he's saying here is that if we, uh, for some circumstance, uh, where it's presented to us to, divide, to die so that someone may live, he's saying here, you know, somewhat, sometimes dying for a just person, uh, that person, uh, it may be a stranger to you, but maybe you've heard about him and, and think he has good character or whatever else, and you have the decision to die for him or you know, die so that he may live. Or maybe you could die for a good person. That's a person, somebody maybe you know, or, or you've had a relationship with, something closer. And you have this decision, do I want to die so that they may live. But verse eight demonstrates and shows that the God of the universe is on display through the cross for the world to see. There was nothing that we could do. There was nothing that we did. We were in rebellion, but God loved us to the extent that even though we weren't a just person, even though we weren't good people, Christ died for us. And 
that's a remarkable thing. That is something that each of us during this time where we have the opportunity not to be busy can dwell on exactly what does that mean for us in our lives, that what God, what Jesus did on the Christ for us. Now I'm going to end it here. There's several more verses that we have. You can go through verse 9 through 11. I would encourage you to read those because it talks about, you know, how we've been saved, how we've been reconciled, and what we need to do with this reconciliation. So I would say read chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and dwell on these different terms. Too many times, you know, we read through the Bible in a year. I would rather us read through Romans 12 times and really get to know what that book or that letter says to us. So I would encourage you again to read verses 1, 5, chapter 5, 1 through 11, and think on these things, because we have an opportunity to do this. I want to appreciate you for watching. I hope I hadn't held you too long, uh, and we will be here uh, at the same time next week. Thank you.